and that hate your people, that even in these circumstances, as in Paul's day, you are bringing about your good purposes. Father, open our hearts and our minds that we might better understand some of these difficult texts so that we might better understand who you are, Lord, so that then we might be obedient to all you call us to do and to be. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So today I want to consider this idea of reprobation, the, the, the doctrine of reprobation, and then the condition of the reprobate. The reprobate are in a condition of judgment under God. As they were then, so they are today. So as much I want, we need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We need to be able to consider what Paul was saying in that first century context, but then how can we apply it to our lives? What can we learn and understand from it? And first of all, reprobation. And Paul then asked this question, and, and really this question, I believe, is a bit of a summary of what his focus has been all the way from Romans chapter 9 through 11. We saw that Paul in chapter 9, that he was disturbed about the vast majority of Israel who had rejected the Messiah. He said if it were possible, he would want to be cursed so that they might be forgiven. We saw that they're the people who had the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises of whom are the fathers, Abraham, David, and Isaac, and all of them. And not just that, but whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. He was an Israelite. How does not the majority of Israel come to Christ? It does not make sense. And many people question that, and they'd come up to Paul, and they would question it. I'm sure it's something Paul struggled over, him being a Jew, an Israelite, a Benjamite. He was a guy who was given to the whole system, but God was able to show him what was happening. So, so we need to look into it. What then? You know, uh, is there unrighteousness with God? We saw in verse t in chapter ten. Is there unrighteousness? They didn't get what they saw. Why not? Well, because they didn't seek it according to God's ways. They sought it by their own fleshly pride. pride. We're of the, 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 the Pharisees would say it all the time. We have Abraham as our father. John the Baptist said, God is able to raise up seed to Abraham from these stones. So there's much that we're able to learn. Yes, God promised to Israel, but they had to come just like everybody else, through humble submission to Christ by faith. They didn't come by faith. They rejected it. They tried to create their own righteousness instead of submitting to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. But it's still a problem. How? Why would Israel not come? What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect, the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So, so as I said, I think the main text to be aware of in understanding this is Romans 9, 6 to 7. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. And when he's talking about that, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, he's not talking about Israel throughout all time. He particularly is talking about the time then present that there's this vast majority of Israel that's not Israel. By and far, they reject Christ. But there, even then, though, was a remnant. There was a small subsection within Israel that did have faith. Is there something for us to learn from that? Of course. But what we see here is about Israel is that Paul was was again talking about fellow Israelites who if it were possible he would have done anything so that they might see this. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks. God has not, Romans 11, 2 says, cast away his people whom he foreknew. God was able at a time when most of Israel were blinded 
to reserve for himself a small amount of Israel at that time, this remnant. God is always faithful. If there's ever a question, it's not God, it's unbelievers. And it's unbelieving first century Israel. But you have to recognize what's going on. It's at this present time there's this remnant according to election. True Israel at that time did obtain salvation through election and through faith. But what about this vast majority that reject him? They were lost. They were reprobate. They were unbelieving. What holds sway when it comes to salvation? What holds sway when it comes to one coming to salvation and one being passed over? Who decides in the matter? Paul made it really clear who decides in Romans 9, 16. So then, it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. And then verse 18 of chapter 9. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. That's hard for man to get our minds around. It's hard for us to recognize, you know what? It's not your will. Your will, as in Adam, is bound. There's only one thing you can will to do, and that's rebel against God. You have a choice what sins you will commit and how you will be enemies of God. Same time then. They didn't have a choice. You're dead in sins and trespasses. Your will doesn't matter. You didn't will to come to God. It's his will. He chooses whom he will have mercy on. But he also decides whom he will harden. That's the harder truth. How can a good, loving God harden anybody's heart? Isn't he supposed to forgive everybody? Now we know that doesn't happen. We know there's not universalism. But think about that truth. It's easy for us, I think, if you've come to faith, to know the love of God and to see how God is directly at work. But those that are in conflict to him, he's also at work. In our minds, we think that all things being equal, we should control whether we have success or failure in life. And in general, that's how life works. You work hard, you're successful. But when it comes to salvation, you can't work for salvation. The Jews thought they could. They thought it's who we are, and they could keep the law and do all of that, and they would gain salvation. It has nothing to do with their works. It has to do with God's will. Whom he chooses and whom he passes over. It's his will. It's not about our will, but God's will. In determining who is saved and who is passed over. In determining who he loves and forgives and who he hates rightly and leaves in reprobation. If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can separate us from the love of God? I get that. He who gave his own son for us, how shall he not freely with him give us all things? But what if God were against you? What if God were angry with you and didn't choose to pour his mercy out on you? What about those folks? Man, God's not fair. God's not fair. That's why Paul's grappling with this. Because you have to understand this. I think if we want a puny God, we can, we can say, let's forget this. We, we could pass from chapter 8 to chapter 12 and, and be done with it. But in understanding the vastness and the greatness of God in salvation over those he saves and those he chooses not to save, we see a very big God who's in control who is sovereign, who has made a plan even as things have gone awry. <laughs> he doesn't work in the same direct manner as he does directly in salvation, 
it's another way where he kind of directs the path of whatever's going on and he passes over. But even their sins are working together to bring about his plan. And he's actively involved in hardening them. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he will and whom he wills, he hardens. Reprobation, the doctrine that God rejects or repudiates some persons to eternal condemnation. It is impossible to have election, the positive side of predestination, without reprobation, which is the negative side. John Kelvin says this, election cannot stand except as set over against reprobation. So again, the question is whether or not election and reprobation are equally ultimate. I think in a respect they are equally ultimate, meaning God decides. God decides who will and will not be saved, but he doesn't work in an equally direct way. And again, you go, I don't understand this. Yeah, we're not going to get our minds fully around this. There's so much mystery mixed up in this. But I think trying to get to the depth of this doctrine will encourage us in our faith of who God is. Does God determine the destinies of individuals in exactly the same way so that without any consideration of what they do or might do, he assigns one to heaven and one to hell? Of course not. But God is ultimate in decreeing all that shall come to pass. That's what makes our God wonderful. That you know what? God created everything good and very good. And then Adam and Eve said, you know what? I will. I don't want to do God's will. I will. And it cast all of mankind into this alternate universe where we're our own God with all the judgments ultimately coming around to death. But what's cool about sin and all of that, God wasn't caught off guard. He's able to rule and reign over all of that and bring about his purposes. It's wild that, that the greatest, I've said it many times, the greatest injustice ever done was the Lord Jesus Christ being killed and crucified on a cross, yet he was innocent. But the greatest good came out of that evil. Those evil men taking him with evil hands, being guilty before God and crucifying him, that was the pre pre uh, predetermined plan and counsel of God. That's a powerful God. So, and this is a, a paragraph that's not in the Second London Confession. Uh, the 1689 is worth studying it. The Westminster Confession says this of God's eternal decree. The rest of mankind, God was pleased according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will, whereby he extends or withholds mercy as he pleases for the glory of his sovereign power over his creatures to pass by or to ordain them to dishonor and wrath for their sin to the praise of his glorious justice. God is glorified. Even the sinner saved for the day of judgment brings glory to God. So it was in that time. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. This is God doing the blinding. They're callously indifferent they're blinded, they're hard-hearted, and made insensible by it. Yet God is actively judging them by hardening them. God judges them by not allowing them to see, not allowing them to hear, but leaving them in their sins. And I can say one thing, if you're sitting here this morning, and your eyes see, and your ears have heard, and you have come to Christ, do you see the great mercy in it? because you're equally as capable of what the majority of Israel did in the first century. That's who we are without God interceding, but God. So, that's reprobation. God, these two, 
in some way, again, you can't help but see that God is sovereignly involved in those he passes over and chooses not to save. That he's working and bringing about his purposes. Definitely not that God is the author of sin, but he is sovereign over sin. As Martin Luther said, the devil is God's devil. Just think about it. All those that have rebelled against God, the devil who is cast down to the earth, everybody, Adam and Eve and their sin and their fallenness, all of those from all of time, God knew how to bring that all about, to bring about his glory and to work in the fallenness of it. And in particular, in what was going on in first century Israel. So the condition of the reprobate is very simply this, to be left under God's judgment. And this is what that judgment looks like. The condition of reprobation, the first part, they're dumb, blind, and deaf. Look at verse 8. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. What I want to impress upon you so that we can understand what Paul is saying in the rest of Romans is that the them and the they that he's speaking about is fallen Israel of first century. Is there application throughout all time? Sure. But the primary context of what Paul is talking about is this Israel is not all Israel. The vast majority that were, were, were opposed to Christ the vast majority that, that crucified Christ, that rejected the preaching of the gospel, were, it was God himself. Look at that. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. God is not completely uninvolved in those that are opposed to him. He's judging them. Part of how he judges them is making them even more blind. Now, again, he's talking about first century Israel, but we know in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and following, and we see it in our culture, what does God do to those that have rejected him? He gives them up. He gives them up. He gives them over. He blinds them, and they run headlong into their sin. But the thing is, that judgment brings glory to God. And it continues to bring about his good purposes. That's why we don't have to sit up late at night when it seems like the, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Our God is sovereign over all of that wickedness. And it's demonstrated right here. And he says to this very day, he's talking about that day in which he lived. This is hard. These are hard-hearted folks folks again as i said that have rejected god completely hard-hearted folks who 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 rejected christ and and had him killed they they rejected the preaching of the gospel in jerusalem there were 3000 that came to christ in jerusalem but i can tell you the gospel didn't take root in jerusalem or among israel like it did throughout the whole roman empire there wasn't as much revival as you would think and it's very much because of what Paul is talking about here. They were under God's judgment, God giving them up, God giving them over. Having God against them. Not just are they hardening their hearts, but, but the Lord God is hardening their hearts himself. Making their them, them unable to understand the gospel, their eyes being closed, their ears being shut. Paul quotes Deuteronomy in this respect. And often when you look in the New Testament, and you can make this a habit, when the New Testament writer quotes from the Old Testament, they're making application to a particular time and space. It opens up what's going on in the Old Testament. Listen, Israel was a hard-hearted group in the desert. They were wandering because they rejected God. They were hard-hearted. They were undisciplined. 
but this is coming to fruition in this first century. Isaiah 29, uh, Deuteronomy, he, he quotes Isaiah and Deuteronomy. In Isaiah it says, For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes. First century Israel by and far rejected Christ. They did not receive their Messiah. They were under judgment. Israel, deaf, dumb, and blind to the truth. It seems completely impossible, but this is what's going on throughout the New Testament. You read the Gospels. Jesus didn't talk to them directly. He spoke to them in parables. In fulfillment of what the Old Testament said would happen. That just like Isaiah, they would be blinded. They'd have a spirit of stupor that they wouldn't understand. There was judgment coming on this people, and this is what reprobation looks like. Jesus talks about, you see it in all of the parables where they have the sower and the seed, but at the end in John it says this, but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. It didn't matter how many signs God did, that Jesus did in the sight of all Israel, that made no difference. Because the only way they would be able to see is if the Lord allowed them to see. He didn't only not allow them to see, he purposely kept it from them. He blinded them to this truth. Were they sinful? Yes, but also God was against them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which is just what he's talking about in Romans 9 through 11 as well, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not. This This is John speaking. Jesus earlier is speaking. This is now the apostle John commenting on the situation, the time then present, when Jesus was going about in Israel. Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. That's not fair. God's not allowing them to come to salvation. That's how it works. He gave them eyes that they could not see. He blinded them from that truth. God has given them a spirit of stupor that they should not understand. So in seeing this judgment, you must, as we have seen, uh, that if, again, you understand the gospel, the opposite is true. We're, we're vessels of mercy. Those remnant in first century Israel, they were vessels of mercy. I think about Paul. What a wonderful guy that demonstrates how horrible you can be, completely contrary to the things of God, yet God can work so mercifully and wonderfully in the life of Paul. It's something for sure for us to learn about what's going on, and we need to have this applicable as we see what Paul's talking about in first century Israel. But again, it's so easy to just jump by all of this and to recognize in our time that God has been good to us. God's been kind to us. If you know the truth, it's not because you have a particular keenness for seeing what's right. It's not because you're particularly astute to understand. God chooses the the weak, those things that are lesser to to put to to, 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 uh, shame the wise and the strong, right? (laughs) We are chosen by him. Our strength, our goodness is all dependent upon the mercy of God. But what does reprobation look like? This is what it looks like. It's not just that that majority of Israel at that time were adverse to God, but God was against them, giving them over to this whole way of living. Secondly, the condition of of reprobation or judgment is about being snared and trapped. And here again, Paul is going to quote David. And each of these things, as you see in Romans 9, Paul throughout of it, throughout it goes back to the Old Testament to quote the condition that they found themselves in. It's such a key. Uh, and then they're going to talk about that escape room that we're going to do and how do you get out of this escape room. And they give you different puzzles and different 
different things that'll give you an indication of where you should go. Well, what's wonderful about the Word of God is the New Testament unlocks what the Old Testament meant. You can use it as a key. When they quote the Old Testament and they expose something to us, we ought to pay attention because it's speaking volumes to us. But the condition of reprobation is judgment, snared and trapped, verses 9 through 10. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their table, let, let all the blessings they have. When you think about your table, that, that's something you gather around where you eat and you enjoy. But even their blessings became a snare to that majority of first century Israel. They were, were falling right into a trap and a stumbling block. Again, let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their necks always. God is against them. They are sinners, but God is giving them over to their sin to bring about his purposes. Paul here is quoting from David again. Now, but he applies this to Israel, this first century context that rejected Christ. In Psalm 69, 22, it says, Let their table become a snare before them and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and make their loins shake continually. Now think about that. I mean, he's given them over to fear. Their sin is bringing about fear and it entrapped within that way of being. And let your wrathful anger, this is the psalm, take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate and not let no one live in their tents. This is about God and what's again hard to understand It's about God judging first century faithless Israel. God's people. But who are God's people? It has nothing to do with that they were the lineage of Abraham. God's people are those he chooses, whom he wills. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Within the same bloodline. If God is against you, who could be for you? John Stott says this about this table. The imagery is not easy to interpret, but their table seems to be a symbol of the security, well-being, and community which are enjoyed at home and which somehow can be turned into the opposite, becoming a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. The reference to their backs being bent forever is also obscure, although the bent back is normally a picture of carrying a heavy load, whether in this case of grief, fear, or oppression. First century Israel were under judgment. It's throughout the New Testament and through the speaking and the talking of what Jesus said, there was judgment coming. Uh, You think about that one parable of of the, the vineyard, the landlord, and he says he sends different ones to them and they kill them and ultimately they kill the son. Jesus said, you're just like your father's. They killed the prophets, and now you're killing me. All of the bloodshed in Israel, all of the judgment was coming upon that generation. First century Israel was under this type of judgment, and within a generation, the Roman armies would destroy Jerusalem and the temple, not one stone left upon another. Now, I don't know. I maybe would have thought of maybe a better way. Maybe all Israel comes to Christ. We start the kingdom in there and we don't have this. But God's plan was to do it this way and to bring judgment on those folks. So so often when we look at this, we have to look at them as a warning to us in our time. Because so many times you can make a direct connection between Israel. They're the religious. They've got the word of God. They're the good people. Like the Pharisees would say, they weren't committing adultery and murder but they were inside like dead man's bones. And there was judgment on them. They're for sure a warning to us. Jesus said this, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies and then know that its desolation is near, 
Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her, for these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In God's plan and purpose in this rebellious first century Israel, God was going to then birth out of that evil the gospel going to all the nations. It wasn't going to be just Israel, but those that were composed of that remnant of the Jews and the Gentiles. God's judgment. R.C. Sproul says this, This blindness and deafness are visited upon people as a judgment for their earlier and prior refusal to hear. Is that not their story? Everywhere Christ went, everywhere the gospel was preached, they heard and what did they do? They rejected it by and far. What was the outcome of that? It was severe judgment on those people. Kelvin states this, the infinite mercy of God towards the elect must appear increasingly worthy of praise when we see how miserable are all they who escape not his wrath. When you see judgment throughout time and space on nations and on peoples that have rebelled against God, what should it do in us? It should invoke praise and thanksgiving that he's poured his mercy out on us. Again, for us today, first century Israel is a warning to us. James Montgomery Boyce says this, this is a critical point. It means that if the blessing of God are misused, thinking about Israel, all they had going for them, and they always are misused unless we allow them to lead us to faith in Jesus as our Savior, they will inevitably harden our hearts, propel us further into sins, and eventually lead us to greater judgment. That's how reprobation works. You rebel against God, he hardens you and pushes you farther away. Do you understand that? It it means that if you will not allow the good things we enjoy, as allegedly Christian people do, to lead you to Christ, which is what God has given them to us for, they will be worse than worthless. They will actually be harmful and propel us inevitably into even greater sin, stupor, hardness of heart and sin. That could be the story of America. That may be the very same story we're living over again. Could be we're just the remnant. And God is going to destroy this nation under judgment. I pray not so, but what I can guarantee you, if it is so, he keeps his own. He knows how to reserve the remnant. He knows how to care for us. He rules and overrules over sin and judgment. The promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. There are great promises to the nations. I can't promise you America will come out of this. But I can promise you judgment will bring God's will about. But I think we should be encouraged to know that God is sovereign, not only in election, but also over reprobation. I'm encouraged and thankful that God is sovereign, not only over those that he loves and saves, but also over those he hates and rightfully judges. That's an encouragement, saint. We don't want some wishy-washy God that just glances over sin. We want a God who is powerful, who does not put up with sin, but rightly judges it. Here's just a little walk through some of what happens in the New Testament where we can see God at work ruling and overruling through those who are reprobate. 
and the 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 choices I could have chosen and the choices we have are endless. Um, in John 12, 39 to 40, they, the people of Jesus' day, could not believe, again, because Isaiah says, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so that they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts no turn, and I would heal them, as they were destined for. They were destined for that. Sounds like they're just doing their own thing and running 100 miles away for an hour away from God. But it doesn't catch God off guard. They were destined for that. He knew it, and he judged them. In John 13, 18, it says, Jesus said, I know those I have chosen, but this, his betrayal by, Ju by Judas, is to fulfill the scriptures. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Remember, he said, I I've lost none except for the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Even, even that one disciple who turned on Christ was to bring about God's good purposes. God rules and overrules over the good and the evil. That's comforting to me. Jesus prayed, while I was with them, the disciples, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you've given me. Again, none have been lost except the one doomed to destruction, just as scripture, that scripture would be fulfilled. 1 Peter 2, 78 says this, Now to you who believe, the stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected. Who were the builders that rejected that stone? In, it was first century Israel, who first and foremost rejected that stone. It says that right in uh, what Paul's been talking about here in Romans. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. They rejected Christ by and far, and they were put to shame. But it didn't catch God off guard. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe the stone who the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message. What? Which is also what they were destined for. God has all of the destiny, destiny and decrees and he's able to bring it all together for his glory and for his good. There's a certain assurance and confidence that we can have to know that God makes all things work together for good. And whenever we think about that, we think, yeah, God makes all things work together for good. And we think about that direct way in which he loves us. And it's true. But what you really need to see is he makes all of the sin and fallenness and all of those that are contrary to him to bring about his good purposes. That should be encouraging in that time and in this time. No? God is sovereign over evil to bring about his purposes. We've been seeing that throughout Romans 9 through 11, this sovereignty of God. But it's a difficult sovereignty. It's a sovereignty that, that, that loves Jacob and hates Esau. It's a sovereignty that God hardened Pharaoh, as I said earlier. It's a sovereignty where God has mercy on some and others he hardens. In Romans chapter 9 is the, 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 the greatest argument for double predestination. The thing is we, we can't totally unwrap that thing. You know, there is a sense in which even those that are reserved for judgment God has reserved them and chosen them for that, but not in a direct way, in an indirect way, by passing over them. 
We need to fear God. We need to be respectful of God. I think also from this, we need to be encouraged. You don't have to sit there and say, why doesn't he love the world? Why doesn't God just choose everybody? What we really ought to be saying is, why did God choose me? Why did he place his love on me? Why did he open my ears and open my eyes? God is sovereign over the elect, and he is sovereign over the reprobate. In conclusion, I think the second London Baptist Confession on the decrees of God, I think, speak about what it ought to create within us. The doctrine of, this is the second London Baptist Confession, Decrees of God, chapter 3, uh, paragraph 7. The doctrine of the high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care so that those heeding the will of God revealed in his word and obeying him may be assured of their uh, eternal election by the certainty of their effectual call, calling. In this way, this doctrine will give reasons for praise, reverence, and admiration of God, as well as humility, diligence, and rich comfort to all who sincerely obey the gospel. Right? That it should give reasons for praise, reverence, and admiration of God, as well as humility, diligence, and rich comfort to all those who sincerely obey the gospel. And, and so I, I, wanted to, I didn't want to just light past this in, in Romans chapter 11. I preached a little bit of this back when, but we need to understand the context of what God is doing here in rejecting that hard-hearted first century majority of Israel who rejected him. But then we're going to see that... <laughs> God's going to bring great good out of it. God is able to turn what is the enemy meant for evil and to bring it around for good. That's encouraging. The greatest answer to the biggest problem in man is this this idea, the the dilemma that we have. If God's all-powerful and all-good, then why is there anybody that can resist him, for one, Or why doesn't he love? If he's all-powerful, who can resist him, right? If he's all-loving, why would anybody receive judgment? But the real answer to it, the greatest answer I find in Scripture, is that God will turn everything around for good. He's going to make everything right. There's nothing. No one gets away with anything. There's no injustices that will not be met in the grand scheme of things at the end of time he will bring it all around for good and even those of us that have been hurt so badly in this broken world he'll wipe every tear away god is sovereign god is sovereign in the midst of all of this so let's come forward and i wanted i wanted to sing hear the call of the kingdom for us because really (laughs) if you've heard the call of the kingdom It ought to be something we praise him about. It's a work of God's sovereign goodness and mercy to us. So let's stand. If we can bring up, we'll bring that up. It is on the overhead. If you'd like to follow along in your hymnals, it's number 419. Hear the 